In screwed news, insurance giant Aetna sent shockwaves through the political world earlier this week when they announced they would withdraw from the Obamacare exchanges in 11 states and only offer insurance in four state-level Obamacare exchanges in 2017. Predictably, conservatives pounced on this news. They said it was proof, proof that Obamacare is doomed to failure. Now, the story is a bit more complicated. It turns out that Edna's decision to pull out of all those Obamacare exchanges had less to do with finance, if it had anything to do with it at all. It was really about political hardball, as far as we can tell. According to the Huffington Post, just last month, in a letter to the Department of Justice, Aetna CEO Mark Bertolini made a clear threat. If President Barack Obama's administration refused to allow a proposed merger with Humana to proceed, Aetna would be in a worse financial position and would have to withdraw from most of its Obamacare markets, and quite likely all of them. Shortly after that letter was written, the Justice Department said it would oppose the Humana Aetna merger, and, well, here we are. So what's the takeaway here? Have Aetna's hardball tactics revealed more about Obamacare? or about our privatized health insurance system as a whole? Joining me now is Dr. Robert Zarr, President of Physicians for the National Health, for a National Health Program, pnhp.org, right? Yes, indeed, Dr. Zarr, great to have you with us. Thanks today. for having me. Uh, first of all, your reaction to this revelation about why Aetna apparently really uh, is blowing itself out of these exchanges. Well, I think, you know, the, the take-home message for me is that um, we can't rely on an industry whose main goal is to make profit. And as soon as that industry, and we're talking about the health care for-profit industry here, realizes that it's really unsustainable for them to be trying to provide health insurance for a population of people who do cost quite a bit for them to receive the care they need to get. And in fact, that takes away from their profit margin. So, you know, we're, we're basically full implementation now with ACA, and we still have 30 million Americans who don't have insurance. Although a lot of that is the result of red state governors refusing to expand Medicaid. A, a big chunk of that is true, that the states, a lot of states have chosen not to expand Medicaid. But even, even with that, we still have another 30 million Americans who are underinsured. Mm. And I think this sort of really underscores what's going on here is that we have, an, we have an issue of Americans not being able to afford quality, lifelong health insurance, which really would logically lead to access to health care, which is really what we all want at the end of the day. Yeah, I and mean, we need to differentiate. Health insurance is a different thing from health care. Health insurance companies don't vaccinate anybody, don't do surgery, don't do anything except move money around. They're banksters, really. And, and, and you know, skimming money off the top. So, so first of all, if, if Aetna goes ahead with this, is Obamacare seriously in trouble? Uh, does this open, you know, create a, a, a really good opening for, for uh, assuming that we have Democrats controlling enough of, you know, the White House and Congress to do something about this? Uh, make an opening for, for example, a public option, which could very rapidly grow to be a single-payer system? Well, that's a good question. And, and, and the truth is, is that when we look at this from the, the perspective of risk sharing, which is what I think Aetna had, had mentioned and what other CEOs of other insurance companies have mentioned, that it's all about the risk pool. So if, if their point is, is that they want to have a larger risk pool, in other words, include sick people with, with healthy people so they can lower the overall cost to them, well, I can give you a really innovative solution to expand risk pool really quickly so it could save us $400 billion a year, and that's have a national health insurance through single payer. $400 so, billion with a so B? $400 billion a year, that's correct if we take out this middleman, which is the insurance company. So, in other words, the, 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 this half a dozen insurance companies that want to become three insurance companies, because there's all these mergers, they're, they're basically taking $400 billion a year out of our pockets? Well, some of this money that we need to administer, to administrate, to actually be able to pay the doctors and pay the hospital for the services that they provide is money that needs to be spent. Someone right. has to actually administer that. Right. But a huge chunk of that money is wasted. And that's that figure that I come up with is $400 billion a year. And it's an important number to take home with you because if we took that $400 billion a year, we could provide health insurance for all Americans, give them lifetime coverage, quality coverage. They could go any doctor, any doctor, any hospital from the day they're born to the day they die. Presumably this is why every other 
developed country in the world ha either has single payer or some close variation to it. And we're the only developed country in the world that does not consider health care a right, but rather continues to consider it a privilege. Is it, is it simply because these big bankster health insurance companies are, are so well entrenched, so powerful, so rich, own so many politicians, thanks to our Supreme Court, that, that it's hard to extricate them from the system? Is that what's going on? Well, look, I'm a practicing physician. I see patients every day. I saw patients today. And my colleagues and I, and I'm talking colleagues around the country here, yeah. are very frustrated that it's hard for us to do the simplest of tasks anymore. It's hard for us to know which medication is on the formulary. It's hard to know which specialist is in the network. Right? It's hard for us to know which hospital we, we can refer to. We're just trying to get our job done as quickly as possible and provide quality care. And we see the insurance companies as they are now as not there to help us or help the patients. The insurance companies are there to keep the system as it is, status quo. Sure. And the ACA, for all the good that it did do, it did provide 20 million Americans, more Americans with an insurance card. It's, it's not the kind of insurance that ultimately all of us want, and that is the insurance card that everybody has. I want every American to have the same access as the President of the United States. Right. And that is in fact what we call an equitable, fair, just system. So, so the President of the United States has single-payer health care? Well, the President of the United States has access to health care when and if he needs it. And that is precisely what every single American should have. That card in the back of your wallet should allow you to get care without having to worry about those deductibles, the co-pays, all the cost sharing that have been increasing, not decreasing in the last 25 years. Right. What, PNHP, you're a great organization. I, I, I've been following you for years and years. I think about a decade ago, I even keynoted your annual address. You did? I, 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 I love PNHP. What are you guys doing to try and promote single-payer health care and what can our viewers do to help? Well, Physicians for a National Health Program, or PNHP.org, has now reached over 20,000 members. It's a generally a, a more or less a physician-led organization. Right. Of course, we are open to anybody becoming a member. Um, and we partner with other organizations like National Nurses United, Public Citizen, uh, among many others, Healthcare for All, so that we can form a larger and larger group and a movement to move this in the direction of single-payer national health insurance. So I would challenge all of your listeners, if you're a nurse, join National Nurses United. If you're a physician, think about joining PNHP. If you're a resident, please join and support health care uh, for all movement. Um, these are organizations that are fighting every day while we're doing our day jobs, while I'm seeing patients, I take time during my schedule to talk about actual real data, real science, and a fairness and a justness that we need to bring back into healthcare. I had um, a, a guest uh, a while ago who said that there's a, there are two, there, there, somebody did a comparison between a hospital in New York, I forget which one it was, I think it may be Beth Israel, and a hospital in Toronto. And the hospital in New York had, and you know, it was like, you know, 15 floor hospital, 500 beds, whatever. They were comparable hospitals, virtually identical. Uh, actually, I, I, we're out of time, I'm sorry. But the, the bottom line, the one in Canada only had one room that did billing, the one in New York had an entire floor. Dr. Zarr, thanks so much for being Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. We'll be right back.